Good to go. Great. Good afternoon. Welcome to Senate Education Friday or Friday, Wednesday, February 15th, uh, 1.30. We actually have a relatively abbreviated or somewhat light gen agenda, I think, today. We may be finished by four. Uh, we have school safety. We're going to return to the walkthrough on S56, have more of a pre-K conversation, and then we're going to wrap up with school construction and have some responses to Senator uh, Gulick's draft bill, which we went through yesterday, and I think we're going to generally hear, you know, pretty good stuff in the endorsement. So I don't think their uh, folks are going to be very long. So with that, Ms. Barbara, do you mind joining us at the table? And we have Secretary French with us on screen. Secretary French, welcome to uh, back to uh, Senate Ed and Director Barbic. We're here talking about um, school safety with a particular eye to the school safety bill that we have before us. But really, first and foremost, and a little bit of an update, any additional information you can provide around what happened last week. Uh, and any sort of lessons learned from that incident that we want to be thinking about as it relates to school safety bill going forward. So with that, the floor is yours. Sure. Uh, <clears throat> good afternoon. Uh, Dan French, Secretary of Education. Uh, yeah, Dee and I are uh, really pleased to be invited back in on this topic, and certainly uh, we had in our minds to provide you uh, an update on, on last week's incident. Um, though that's that analysis is still unfolding, but um, Again, you know, thank you for the opportunity to come in and testify uh, on this very important topic. Um, we're just going to provide some oral comments for you today and be happy to engage in question and answer. Um, but as you know, we did uh, bring forward uh, some recommendations on how to improve our statutory framework uh, for school safety back in January. Um, we know the committee has taken a lot of testimony since then. Um, and, you know, firstly, just want to express our gratitude. Uh, an appreciation for your interest in working on this important issue. In January, our testimony uh, basically was around shifting uh, well-established and what we'd, we'd characterize as well-resourced uh, best practices that have been supported uh, over the last decade or so. Um, and our recommendation is essentially to shift um, from those practices being recommendations to making them more permanent uh, requirements. And our main rationale for bringing forward this recommendation now um, really rests on this just uh, assertion that uh, only with a recommendation will we see consistently across uh, the state uh, an approach to school safety. Essentially, to summarize that, um, it's unacceptable in our view to have some schools be more safe than others. Um, and it's only through a requirement that we can ensure uh, that all schools are safe. Our proposal that we uh, brought forth in January um, is still where we strongly encourage the, the committee to take action. Uh, the, the four requirement areas that we propose are options-based drills, um, the consistent approach to emergency operations planning, which uh, Dee will talk about in a minute relative to what happened last week, um, requiring a policy on access control and visitor management, and lastly, sort of the newest innovation in this area uh, is a requirement to maintain uh, a behavior threat assessment team, which we think is really integral to getting out in front of a lot of these issues. Um, I'd also just wanna highlight, um, I haven't, I don't think we've testified on yet, but we've also been working really from the inception of this work earlier in the fall with the understanding that uh, the agency would be working on new regulations. Um, and you might be familiar uh, last year with the pupil waiting uh, law, uh, there was a requirement that the agency engage in the creation of what are called district quality standards and also uh, the articulation of a new quality assurance process. So we've embedded school safety in that regulatory work. We just filed uh, with ICAR uh, last week, so that should be on their agenda for their meeting later, uh, I guess, next week. Um, but just want to reassure the committee that uh, that regulatory approach, you know, we've we've done it in 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 mind of making these recommendations, and we think that regulatory approach will uh, provide the necessary direction to the agency to adequately support and oversee the implementation of these requirements. Um, but again, we think there is some urgency uh, on this matter, and wanted to express our appreciation for your interest in working on this. And uh, I would offer, particularly from the Agency of Education's perspective, 
um, as you work more towards finalizing a bill in this area and offer our uh, legislative council and our legal team support to work with you and your ledge council to, to come up with a really solid version of this law. Um, but to underscore the urgency and the importance of it, I'll turn it over to Dee now, who will, uh, as you know, heads up the governor's task force on violence prevention and, and will make some remarks uh, regarding the incident last week relative to this broader body of work. Great. And before we do that, yeah, does anybody have any questions for Secretary French? And the one note I have, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, Senator Bulick, you were wondering about teacher training. Like, I think it came up in this conversation that, um, you know, teachers aren't coming to the table. They're coming to teach French, math, whatever. And there's a training component or something in it that some teachers might not want to be a part of. Does that make sense, Secretary French? Yeah, maybe to a certain extent. I think, uh, you know, the experience I've had over the years, I think when I came in in January, you know, my career as a teacher, then a principal superintendent, I've seen this work evolve over the years. I haven't had direct experience as a school level leader uh, with mm -hmm. the uh, threat assessment process. That's sort of something that's been evolving in the last couple of years. Um, but I will say, in terms of the all hazards sort of planning and the options based drills, um, we don't we don't think about different classes of employees or different types of employees. Every it's really for all employees. It's it's everyone needs to be involved in that, whether you're a custodian or a teacher. So there isn't specific training relative to your type of status other than you might be in charge of a classroom and so forth. But again, um, from our perspective, there's been a lot of professional development resources offered on this to the extent, like anything we do in the state, that it trickles down to an individual teacher saying, well, I'm unaware of it. Um, we think, again, that just underscores the need to make this a requirement so there is greater consistency and implementation across the state. Yeah, and that, that's a good point, Senator. And uh, mm -hmm. I will say this, the idea of really, you're speaking about the options-based drills. Um, that has evolved a lot uh, as, as the threats have evolved. What I see now, it's sort of best practice in that area is far more responsive to sort of the social emotional impact on the practitioners than it was originally. Uh, like a lot of things, you know, we're reacting uh, to certain circumstances uh, to make our schools safe. But I think there's been more effort put into thinking about the impact of the practitioners. Um, I also think, you know, it's one of the reasons I really strongly support the, the behavior threat management approach, because that really gets into, it really starts on the premise of social psychology and from an assets persp perspective, um, how to support people, how to support uh, students in particular. Um, so I think, you know, I think all this work is evolving. Again, I don't, I don't necessarily think it will not continue to evolve absent a change here, but I think it's really important um, by moving to a requirement, we get some consistency around common language. So we don't have people using old inversions of how to do this. We, we can really stay consistent across the state and evolve together. That's really important with our professional development that we have a common language when we bring people together. Um, and if you're familiar, everything we do in Vermont, when it's a local local decision, we end up half the time when we bring people together is just doing the translation of like, well, in your district, it means this. and In this district, it means that. Uh, so it's really important that we move towards common language that I think a requirement would enable us to do. Oh, yes, I agree. And I do consider myself a tough broad. And I did lose my father to gun violence. So I am, you know, I'm extremely um, sensitive to um, any kind of media that's like over sensationalized, yeah. which is what sure. 
what we had that day. So anyway, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Ms. Uh, D, if you want to. Please. And um, for the record, my name is Steve Barbeck. I'm the director of violence prevention. Um, to uh, just um, move along from what Secretary French had, had um, started off with in his testimony. Um, again, you know, our goals are consistency, common language, um, and that all of our schools are able to have the same level of safety across the board. Um, and again, the four areas that we're looking to address um, is uh, options-based drills, the policy on visitor management that schools um, implement uh, an emergency operations plan that's at least as comprehensive as the template that's provided by the Vermont School Safety Center, and the behavioral threat assessment teams for supervisory unions and districts. Um, with the experience that we had last week with the hoax calls, I think that really brought to light some of the points that we're making with this proposal and that uh, emergency operations plans um, were critical in, in, those, in dealing with those kinds of situations. And part of emergency operations plans um, include communications, a huge part of that, and, and how critical those communications are. Um, visitor management again um, ensuring that the schools were secured had these been in fact actual events um, and then um, the option options based drills so that schools were able to make, make a decision take um, options that were most reasonable under the circumstances wherever that school was in the state and again we, as you know we saw these throughout the state in, in a variety of different different areas in terms of the actual um, hoax calls from last week, um, there have been some um, debriefings. Um, we're actually having one, another one this afternoon. And our goal is to understand where there are any gaps exist and identify those and how we can make improvements. Um, we need to use these as um, a learning platform. So you know, thank goodness that none of these were actual events. Um, however, I think that we can use it as a tool to make our systems better, um, make our schools safer. And with that, um, we need to understand the responses that each school made in collaboration with the law enforcement response. Um, again, that communication, um, where things um, you know, could have been done better, how things went very well. Um, and I think when we look into each of these incidents, my expectation will be that we'll see a variety of, along that, that platform. Um, and that's what we are exactly looking to um, alleviate through our proposal, is that all schools um, have a plan in place that can respond to a variety of emergencies. Again, this one was the hoax uh, calls on the shooter. But as I mentioned in past testimony, it could be anything from electrical outages to fires to a number of different incidents. So, um, you know, we want to identify also um, our ability to identify hoax calls in the future. So I think, um, again, we will look to do an assessment of these, each of these 22 incidents more closely. Um, but, you know, it, communication being key is understanding that after receiving a number of very similar calls we start to I you know say okay this this seems a little odd out of the ordinary um, but I also um, importantly is to ensure that our response to those doesn't diminish um, just because there's an assumption oh this might be a hoax so every one of these um, calls was law enforcement did respond to them law enforcement did go to the schools and ensure that in fact there was not an active shooter so um, you know, we want to, again, do an assessment, ensure what, how we can make improvements um, in how responses were to these particular cases. Um, Senator Hashim. Um, can I just ask a question sure. about the hoax calls? Um, and if you can't speak to this, I fully understand. But, you know, from my perspective, one of my biggest concerns is that it, it almost seemed like a coordinated effort to stress test the system. and. Uh, and I was wondering, I mean, is this something that's also happened in other states recently, or it is? Yeah, um, it, 
During the summer or later part of the summer and in the fall, um, we were made aware of other states that were experiencing, I can't name them off the top of my head, but we were aware that other states were experiencing hoax calls of a similar nature. And so we were aware and prepared to a degree that, hey, this is happening in other states. So um, uh, to my knowledge, in you know the last month or so, I'm not aware of any other states that were experiencing these hoax calls. We then got ours, and my understanding is that there were other states um, the same day or within a couple of days who were also experiencing the same the same thing. Yeah, it's, it's uh, to me that's even more concerning than <clears throat> than a 13 year old playing a prank. But yeah, I was just curious. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just wanted to add to uh, Senator Eshin's question that uh, I, I did some visits on Monday to uh, county schools, the supervisory level, and they were actually aware of the fact that other states had had a hoax, so at least they had a sense, sense of sensitization of uh, such a uh, unusual event. Yeah. And I think the important thing, too, is that um, with that knowledge, the response was still the same, so not making an assumption that, oh, this must just be a hoax, that there was um, a, a responses there should have been um, for each of these. So you felt as, you felt confident you know, across the board that the response was consistent and quick as you would have hoped? Yes. And I mean, that's not so much our purview, you know, law enforcement, but uh, you, you feel you were pleased yeah, with, with the, um, you know, we were in communication, direct communication with uh, Department of Public Safety, with the commissioner and the colonel, and we were ensured that there was a law enforcement response to each of the, the incidents, and I feel, um, you know, that that was handled quite well. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Once you have your debrief and you've had time to sort of put your thoughts together, can we be rebriefed yes. as well? Yes. That'd be great. Great. Do you have a timing on that? I'm part a timing, a sense of when that all, when I, sort of the next stage of like the, the work that you're doing to understand what happened. I don't, I will know more after we meet this afternoon. Okay. Um, but right now I don't. Sure. Senator Williams. So in a former life, we had what we call standard operating procedures mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and safety is everybody's business. School safety is, but when everybody's looking at it, nobody in particular is looking at it. What agency is the head agency? to establish a standard operating procedure in a situation in the school, like what we just experienced. Does everybody have a common language, for example, what the uh, secretary said? Is there anything in writing as it starts at the top and gets driven down to the local school, then the SOPs could expound upon different situations with unique situations that the schools might have. And do we have any such thing? As so um, in terms of the, if I understand your question, so the schools, what we're proposing here is that every school have an SOP or what we call an emergency operations plan on how to, to deal with a variety of situations. And part of that is that they also collaborate with their local emergency management, so their town. Um, so they're working uh, very closely together and the town know okay, if this is the communication, if there is an emergency at the school, and then they have collaborated. This, the town is aware of what the school's emergency operation plan is. Um, so from that perspective, that's our goal, is that every school has these in place um, so that they are prepared um, to deal with these. So I'm, what I'm suggesting is it be top-driven, maybe Department of Public Safety, because I was the emergency management coordinator mm -hmm. in my town, and we had a lockdown at our high school, and nobody in the town of government knew about it. Mm -hmm. So there's got to be communication that's got to go laterally, mm -hmm. up and down, and it's, it should start at the top and be driven to the local level. And yes, and yeah. you're absolutely right. I was going to chime in, uh, Senator. I, you know, that's, I think, the intention of what we're proposing to a certain extent. But just to echo on, on Dee's previous comment, we have, you know, this long established partnership we call the Vermont School Safety Center, which is a joint partnership between Department of Public Safety and the Agency of Education. That is sort of the source of truth, if you will, in terms of the templates of the planning and so forth. But because it's a recommendation, people 
take that template out and do different things with it. And we don't have a lot of visibility into the quality of the emergency operation plans. Essentially, what this proposal will do in conjunction with the district quality standards, it makes it a regulatory approach supervised by the agency of education. So we would, you know, the agency of education is not expected to have uh, public safety expertise. We would still rely on our state partners and our outside resources to develop these models. But we would, by making it a requirement, then bring it into a more stronger uh, regulatory approach. And we'd have a definitive uh, oversight of that coming from the agency of education. And following up on uh, Senator Williams' question, I, and so yeah, this bill will do it, and then you, we're all thinking about the other external coordinations that are yeah happening. Yeah. And yeah, and that will be part of our conversation yeah. this afternoon as well. Great. Thank you. Um, and I don't I don't think any of that work ever goes away. You know that sure. that's yeah, sure. that's the piece that has to be practiced and. The professional development, but we're eliminating one variable uh, by creating a requirement here, and that we're all working from the same recipe, if you will, as opposed to having the potential for 200 different recipes out in the landscape. So, if people are working from a common template and then taking that template uh, in the context of their specific ecosystem to consider what their specific resources are and so forth, it still provides us with a real solid basis for convening professional development and providing technical support. And, and another key part of that is that in the proposal uh, that schools um, uh, reevaluate that every, every year annually. Um, and again, there's so many things change. You know, um, there may be a change in the structure of the school or an addition of classrooms or a, a whole variety of things. So having them review the EOPs annually and take into consideration those changes and make those modifications is um, really important as well. I think also just to add on to this, um, we're likely to experience a period of increased staffing volatility in the education system. So um, anytime we see people turning over in key leadership positions as we are, we are now, it just underscores for me the importance of having SOPs, of having standardized practices, because if we rely on individuals to bring this work forward and people are turning over in key positions, there's a real potential that this could get lost. Uh, to Dee's point, this looks needs to be looked at annually. Uh, by creating that as sort of a, a requirement, then we're, we're insulating ourselves from the volatility of the staffing patterns that are likely to be a, a part of our future as an education system. Just, just one more point, I'm, I'm trying to find out, you know, when you develop an SOP, everybody will copy it. There's certain things that everybody has to do. That way, if you go to another school, they should be able to go to that school, uh, emergency SLP, and, and know where they're supposed to go when this happens. And I'm not sure that the administration even has a, has a plan to make that happen. Well, and I think that's partly, correct me if I'm wrong, that is I, ideally, if we pass this, then if I'm teaching math at one school, yep. I'll get the same training, I get transferred to another school, I'll be able to have the, I mean, it's basically the same kind of, Correct. I'll be ready to roll. Correct, yeah. and and as the secretary had mentioned, it's utilizing the same template. They're gonna have to be minor changes because each school is a little bit different, but that basic template, that basic plan will be the same. Okay, I'll get off yeah. No, no, no. It's, it's, it's a really, no, no, it's a good question. And it's a key question, and, and it's a key goal in, in all this. Can you just say a couple words, for my own understanding, of what exactly happened with this situation? When you're talking about swatting, it, it, the only thing I can think of, and I'll just show my, it's, it's almost like a robocall kind of thing. I, but I, I, you know, is that sort of what's going out? Different, somebody's hitting something on a computer, it's, it's heading out, a message is heading out to all these places, phones are ringing, they're picking up and they're hearing some kind of message. It, it, it can happen in a, a number of different okay. ways. Um, in this case, um, my understanding is that it wasn't a computer generated voice. Okay. So um, it wasn't sort of uh, the robocall like when you get the computerized voice on your cell phone robocall kind of thing, you know, call this number. Right. Or, 
you know, give us your credit card information right. and or what have you. Vote for Campion. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, so, One of those. Yeah. So my understanding is that it, from from that respect, it wasn't like a computerized voice. Um, in terms of the technicality of how these work, I'm not sort of a phone IT sure. person, but um, my understanding is that there are ways that the the actual location can be concealed by bouncing these calls off of a variety of different places and they become very difficult to track down. Um, we, our partners with the FBI are also involved in uh, the investigation. So, uh, you know, that they have the, the tools and the ability to, to do more work in that area. Um, but again, it, it is it's very difficult to, to track the origin where those calls originated from. Did you say VPN? Is that yeah, the virtual private network. Yeah. It can, you know, it's, it's how people access the dark web is they through a VPN and then it bounces to a IP address in Switzerland and then Brazil and then Guatemala and then you know goes to the website address. So is has there been success out there generally to track these groups down or is it just so hard? I know that it's very difficult, yeah, and I don't yeah, know what the yeah, success rate yeah, is. Okay. Any other questions? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> okay. The, um, if I could just add one last thing. Um, in testimony a couple of weeks ago, there uh, was some conversation about the behavioral threat assessments and mm -hmm. the training yeah. and a little bit more information about those. And I would offer... Um, to have Dr. Marissa Rondazzo testify remotely, and she is a subject matter expert in behavioral threat assessments, and she has um, started a, um, well, she's a psychi psychiatrist, and she is basically yeah. one of the most, the yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and she has, she's actually done trainings for us in Vermont for um, schools and administrators on behavioral threat assessment, and was also um, doing a, pre a very a fantastic presentation at the Governor's School Safety Conference in the fall. And she is more than willing to testify remotely and um, give an overview of behavioral threat assessments and answer any questions you have um, related to that. And I think it's great to have her come in if you have the availability and the time, um, given that she does do trainings for us here in Vermont. So she is um, you know, the person we go to for those kinds of things. Yeah, and her name is on the list, and I couldn't remember when I saw the name who she was. So yes, thanks That'd for bringing great. that up. Thank and we'll Thank hopefully have her in next week if she can, if she can do it. OK. Great. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thanks for your work. Secretary French, thanks for your work. I know it was a crazy couple of days for all of you last <laughs> week. So. Can't even imagine. Yeah. Thank you for your time. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Is Beth Zooming or is she in person? All right. Beth will be here in a second. Okay. Welcome back to Senate Education. We started, did a really good, I thought, uh, overview of S56. Thank you for that yesterday. Uh, Ms. St. James, sort of understanding what it is, how it works, the pre-K piece. Uh, and then we ran out of time, so we thought another 15, 20 minutes on it would be helpful. So with that, we'll let you kind of take us through it in a little bit more detail. Sure, that's St. James, Office of Legislative Counsel. I think we, um, I think we stopped around page eight or page nine. Is that everyone's That's memory? accurate. Okay. I have us at, well, I have a seven, but seven. So yeah, eight. That'd be great. Okay. So we're talking about program requirements. Mm -hmm. And so perhaps the last we talked about was at the bottom of page seven. Um, and you'll see that there's a lot of strike throughs here, right? So this is using the existing framework for the pre-K statute. So there was already a section on um, uh, what it meant to pre-qualify, and we're just kind of relabeling that as program requirements. And you'll see that there are things that used to be required of a pre-K program, a pre-qualified pre-K program that are crossed out now. Um, and then you'll see things that aren't crossed out that are current law that this draft proposes to keep, and then you'll see underlined language that's a new program requirement. So, <clears throat> 
there was a, an accreditation requirement on page seven, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> seven line 10. There was a teacher licensing requirement on page seven line 17. And then if we go on to, um, and those, those, were, um, those were current requirements as well. If you go on page eight, um, new, there's a couple new requirements here. So one is that they meet, the program meets the criteria for, and remember this is the public pre-kindergarten education yep. program, meets the criteria for hours of operation and minimum number of school days pursuant to section 1071. And we talked about the fact that um, 1071 specifies that there are 175 days of student attendance in the school year. Um, there are some uh, waiver provisions that are not necessarily applicable to this um, conversation, but just to know that it's not a bright line um, there, and that was used, I think, during the pandemic. Um, but minimum uh, hours of operation is defined by state board rule, and the state board defines minimums, and then it's up to the school district to set the hours of operation for their schools. So for kindergarten, the minimum number of hours in state board rule for the day to count for student attendance is two hours a day. That's the minimum. Two, okay. Yes. Or uh, an aggregate of 10 hours over a five day week. Okay. Um, and then it's up to the school district to set the what the school day looks like. Okay. So this is saying that, <clears throat> and there'll be another requirement for the state board to amend their rules to bring in pre-K where it wasn't accounted for before. And so this would be an area where there is direction later on in the bill for the state board of education to amend their rules to define what a minimum number of hours for a pre-K program would look like. Uh, requirement online, new requirement, program requirement online five, page eight, is allowing a pre-kindergarten child to attend on a part-time basis on a schedule established by school board policy. And then there's a reference to uh, section 563 in title 16, which is the school board uh, duties section. And that's just a reference to the fact that there are some procedures they have to follow when they're adopting policies. And then the last um, new requirement here on page eight, line eight, is the use uh, use play-based curriculum and programming. The program is required now to use play-based curriculum and program. What does that mean? I think that would be a question for uh, the okay. field or the agency. Yeah, we um, we had the same question in uh, health and welfare, mm -hmm. and realized that we need to come back, and there needs to be a definition of play-based okay. curriculum. It's, it's play. It's. I mean, my kids went to a play-based preschool. It's. You focus on learning through play as opposed to like sitting down and, you know, doing math problems or it's just instead of academic focused, it's play focused. I mean, I, I'm putting it simply, but that, from my experience as an educator and a parent, that's what it is in a nutshell. And that was for pre-K for them. Yeah. So it's not Xbox. Not X Xbox is not part of that. <laughs> I think, does Mr. Fisher, did you want to say something? Uh, yeah, for the record, Ted Fisher, from my agency of education, the agency's director of communications and legislative affairs. I really don't want to chill in the water, so I apologize. But I believe the National Association for the Education of Young Children, or I mean, mess up how to pronounce the acronym, but NIAC, uh, accreditation, which is on line 10 of uh, page seven. I'm 95% sure that that is a play based process. So perhaps there's a definition. Um, I'm not 100% sure. I'm fairly certain that that accreditation is focused on play based. Are you looking at the bill? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, line 10, page eight. Okay. So it's, so it's that, that page list. Seven. Oh, page seven, line four 10. And four. Um, oh, okay. So, so we, we noticed that. Um, Nate, right. That one item is by definition the other. But. Okay. So you want to sell it? And is this, yeah, and we can take some testimony, more testimony, we can make sure that we're not heading down some paths that wouldn't work. Uh, Senator Weeks, did you have it? No, I don't. No. Okay. Um, you are correct that that term is not defined in this bill. Okay, thanks. So the next subsection, uh, page eight, line nine, is uh, the 
the money part, tuition, budgets, average daily membership, you'll see that that language is not underlined or, or um, and there's no strike through there, so that's the current subdivision heading. Um, and so <clears throat> this set out, this section sets out how uh, how students, how a school district knows they have to pay for a pre-kindergarten child, right? Because not every, this is not a mandatory program. Mm -hmm. So if you go down to P, a line 18, so if a district maintains a public pre-K program, parent or guardian can enroll their child in public pre-k simply by um, enrolling their child in their district of residence with the school district if a district does not maintain we're on page nine now if a district does not maintain a public pre-k program the district um, has to pay tuition and they pay tuition pursuant to subsection 823a of this title which is a reference to the um, town tuition program chapter, and that section is the elementary tuition section, and it basically says that if you are tuitioning a student from a public school district to a public school district, you're just paying the full tuition charged by the public elementary school. So this would be paying the full tuition charged by the public pre-K program. Um, but how does the district know to do that? So that they have to, there's a kind of a two-step process. So the district has to receive notice that the child is enrolled in a public pre-kindergarten or will be enrolled in a public pre-K program outside of the district. And then the child also has to be concurrently enrolled in their district of residence to receive that tuition payment. So it's a two-step process there. Um, that's almost exactly what happens now. So the tuition goes to the program? Yeah. Okay. And that's that's what's happening now. Yes, and when so the parents can just go to the school they're choosing, and according to the way this is written, and then they go back and tell the town, hey, okay. Yes, we have a spot. Okay. We are a resident here. You owe us tuition, and then yeah, the tuition's paid. Um, <clears throat> let's see. Um, just some conforming changes um, further down the page in subdivision three, adding that this is pub, we're referring to public pre-kindergarten education programs here, um, uh, requiring uh, school districts to put pre-K costs in their budget. Um, <laughs> subdivision four is, this, is, is current law, and this is about average daily membership and how we're calculating per pupil spending, and we'll get to that a little bit later. So you. Um, districts uh, can include pre-K children um, if they're providing education for them or if they pay tuition to them in their average daily membership. Okay. And then there's a section here on the very top of page 10 that was struck because it's not applicable anymore. It was about a, a private provider being able to charge more than what the school district was paying um, for a program for, you know, for their private program, but that's not... Um, relevant anymore because there's no private provision for, for public funds to go to private um, organizations in this bill. And then subsection E on page 10 is um, <clears throat> requiring uh, AOE in consultation with Building Bright Futures to develop and present rules to the state board for adoption. And what is required in those rules has been amended. Um, and you'll, if we want to jump to page 11 to what this bill proposes is required in those rules, they have to, on page four or line four, they have to require the school district to provide uh, opportunities for effective parental participation. Um, they have to establish a process uh, for um, enrollment. Uh, jumping on page 12. Line six, the rules have to require a district to include identifiable costs um, in its budget and reports to the community. The rules have to require the district to report to the agency of education um, uh, some uh, uh, annual expenditures to AOE to provide an administrative process for um, complaints from a parent or guardian or provider to challenge the action of a school district or the state. Um, and then on page 13, a monitoring system. 
So AOE has to monitor the programs, collect data on the programs, and at a minimum that monitoring and evaluation program has to include um, programmatic details, including the number of children served, the number of um, public pre-kindergarten education programs operated, <laughs> financial investment made to ensure access to quality pre-K, the quality of the public pre-K education, the results um, for children, including school readiness, and you'll see here that instead of proficiency in numeracy and literacy, which is current law, the, this bill proposes to require readiness and social, uh, the results of school readiness and social emotional development. Um, documenting for progress, um, to use that process to help individualize instruction and improve program practice, and collect and report uh, so you, child you progress. Yeah, I do have a question. I'm not sure you'll be able to necessarily answer it, but, but um, this keeps coming up for me when as we talk about this bill, because um, we're talking about programmatic details, um, and I'm just wondering if, a, if we have pre-K, sort of pushed into the public system, will it not be sort of scrutinized in the same way that all other uh, grade levels are hmm. scrutinized? So will it be subject to like EQS, for example, and, um, you know, will it have to report uh, um, Good question. outcomes? And I, yeah, because that's not made super clear. So yeah. the there are specific requirements here for, um, some reporting requirements. Um, and I, this bill does not include any amendments to the EQS section. Um, and without pulling it up in front of me off the top of my head, I don't know if it refers to a specific grade set or just public schools in general. And so I would wanna look at that. Um, but I would say for the sake of walking through this bill, um, there, this bill lays out specific program, specific monitoring and compliance requirements for pre-K specifically. Um, okay. And I, I will look at the EQS statute and and send an email to the group on, I just don't know off the top of my head if it says public schools or K through 12, and there needs to be an amendment there, which would be a policy decision. Okay, thank you. Um, and then there's um, uh, on uh, page 14, subsection G is specifying that there's no limit or there's no prohibition on a private pre-kindergarten provider from, pri from providing private pre-kindergarten education in accordance with uh, DCF's rules. And then um, the whole giant chunk that is struck out on page 14, subsection H, is we touched briefly on this, this geographic limitations concept where currently the law does allow school districts to limit the area their um, students can seek those 10 hours of pre-K, publicly funded pre-K from. And this section uh, lays out the framework for those geographic limitations, um, and that is uh, repeal. The proposal here is to repeal that. Page 16, <clears throat> there we're getting into some conforming amendments. So, um, legal people, the definition here is um, amended to a so the definition would read as used in this section, legal people means an individual who has attained instead of five, four years of age, on or before September 1 of the school year. However, school district may require that students admitted to kindergarten have attained five years of age on or before any date between August 31st and January 1st. So it doesn't change the kindergarten cutoff conundrum. Right. Um, we're just including four-year-olds in the definition of legal people. The rest of that statute, um, there are a couple other sections that are um, amended, and that is the section uh, included pre-kindergarten and essential early education. Essential early education is essentially special education for birth through school age. Um, and uh, pre-K was lumped in here, and so this is 
splitting them apart. So pre-K children are now up in the definition of legal people, and essential early education is its own subset, and that's an individual who is not a legal people may be enrolled in a program of essential early education offered pursuant to 2956 of this title, and that's referring to the special education chapter where early education, essential early education is referenced. And then there's just a, um, a drafting convention change in the next subdivision. <clears throat> Funding on page 17. Uh, just, yeah, please. just one quick question, because um, you're obviously very familiar with this. Does, uh, does the pre-K program become obligatory for the for the parents and the children, or is it an optional for the parents? It's not. School attendance is only mandatory from grade from ages six through okay. sixteen in the state, okay. so it doesn't change that. Thank you. Um, section six, page seventeen, line three. This is an amendment to the definition section of the school funding chapter. It's the last chapter in Title 16, Chapter 133. This is the definition section for it. And so we're making an amendment to who is included in average daily membership year um, and making it clear that pre-K children um, uh, in public pre-K programs are included here. And then again, you'll see at the bottom there in subdivision C, pre-K children and children receiving essential early education services were lumped together and now we're splitting them apart. So this would, section would only apply to uh, children receiving essential early education services. Okay. And then um, again, an amendment to the pre-kindergarten child on page 18, that definition um, to conform with the rest of the bill. <clears throat> And then a new definition of child receiving essential early education services to split them up. Uh, section 7, page 19. <clears throat> this is the waiting um, statute. So you'll see on line 17 on page 19, <clears throat> pre-kindergarten children in current law receive a weight of negative 0.54 for determining weighted long-term membership. You'll see that the next section there is grades six through eight, right? What happened to kindergarten through grades five? Well, they have a weight of one, so they're not listed. So by repealing the pre-kindergarten weight, you're automatically lumping them into the elementary school weight. Yeah. And then there are um, two conf um, conforming amendments on page 20 that are outside of my area of expertise related to um, transportation and um, uh, schools, so just making sure that pre-kindergarten programs are included in school zones and state speed zones. And then page 21, section 10, um, is uh, the creation of the second de deputy secretary position and an appropriation for funding that position. Um, and you'll see that that's authorized to begin in fiscal year 2024. And then section 11 is um, some rulemaking directives. So it starts with the DCF rulemaking um, requirements in subsection A, and we're gonna skip those and go <clears throat> to subsection B on page 22. And so because of the changes that this bill proposes to make to the pre-K provision of pre-kindergarten in the state, the agency is um, directed to consult with Building Bright Futures and amend the following rules to incorporate the new changes to the public pre-kindergarten education program. So we talked about the length of the school day rule, um, the rule regarding full-time equivalent enrollment of pupils, and then the pre-kindergarten education rules themselves. And then there are, um, I, didn't, the, I didn't draft this, Abby Shepard, um, who handles all of the tax matters in my office, drafted the sections related to um, property tax. Um, and I just wanted to uh, flag those because they do come before the DCF section of the bill. Um, and if you want to walk through of those, I would recommend Abby to come in. But that's the pre-K section, the public pre-kindergarten education program section. So again, it looks like we're, we've got two paths that a, a bill, a separate bill will end up in this committee, uh, which will 
look like this, basically these sections, I think, with a sponsor or multiple sponsors. Uh, and so health and welfare will, sounds like we'll work on this stuff, the early childhood stuff. We'll probably get a bill in here, beyond the wall. We'll start to do a little testimony, not expect it to take it up really seriously this year, but more get ready to take it up, I think, in next year. That being said, there may be questions that come up over the next several weeks that we would need want answers to during the summer. That so we might put together some kind of study program. You know, what is the universal pre-K? What would it cost? I'm putting down. You know, what would the imp economic impacts on the independent pr uh, providers be? When should the deputy secretary be put? But you know, those kinds of things we might want to work on, or have a study committee put to you know work on over the summer. So the thing that I'm kind of stuck on at the moment is, uh, you know, we've heard some testimony that's, you know, generally in opposition to universal pre-K at the risk of um, jeopardizing private providers. Um, I've also heard that recently from some constituents. And then there's the fact that it's not included at all in the RAND report. It just feels really counterintuitive that we now have this big thing in front of us that's not in the report, doesn't seem to have much support from providers. And I mean, I, I'm, I also recognize that there's always two or more sides to a story. So I'd, I'd like to hear from proponents um, and supporters of this uh, who, will, who can also address some of the concerns yeah. that we've been hearing. Uh, yeah, absolutely. so the answer is yeah, absolutely. But just so you know, we wouldn't, because of timing and uh, like you said you're here we're hearing more about the you know independent providers and giving people access zero to four and zero to five this is something we'll if we do decide to take it up we would take it up next year mm -hmm. in the meantime though we can hear from some some of the pro people over the next couple of weeks saying hey this is this is why you guys should do it next year but there's no expectation from the corner office in fact, no direction, I should say, from the corner office, pro tem's office, that we would be able to get to that, to, to passing a pre-K bill this year. Mm -hmm. Thus, that's why it sounds like it's gonna be split off, that we will pass some kind of- The other part of it. The other part of it. But we won't do that, because that's not our jurisdiction. Right. Okay. Yeah, does that make sense? Yep, no, that makes okay. sense. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Any questions from the St. James? Thanks okay, thank you. thank you. Let's take five minutes and we'll come back and we will hear from uh, our two witnesses um, talking a little bit more about pre-K. Welcome, Ms. Webb. Glad you're here. Uh, we are talking about pre-K. And uh, Ms. Baker, I see you also have joined us. Uh, so, Ms. Webb, your name was given to us uh, as someone who could address a little bit of, you know, the, some of the pre-K stuff that we're looking at you know, as it relates to the intersection with the independent child care providers. Um, you're at Winooski Valley. Well, let's see, you're the Act 166 coordinator for the Winooski Valley Superintendents Association. Yes. So maybe say a little bit about that and then uh, tell us what you're thinking. Yeah. And, think, and then we have an Addison County uh, Regional Coordinator. So, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Is Winooski your district? Mm -hmm. okay. Well, so it's not actually Winooski oh. School Districts because oh. that's the that's the confusion. Um, okay. So my name is Rebecca Webb. Um, I am the Act 166 coordinator for the Winooski Valley Superintendents Association. So we're just going to call it WVSA. It's a lot less confusing. Um, they are 10 supervisory unions, um, so it's a very unified union, Central Vermont, Harwood, Lamoille North and Lamoille South, Montpelier Roxbury, Orange Southwest, um, Orleans Southwest, Washington Central, and White River Valley. Um, so a pretty good swath of the mm -hmm. state. Um, as noted in the written testimony, we have over 1,400 preschoolers between the ages of three and kindergarten that currently receive uh, universal preschool. In a yeah, and just so everyone model. knows, I should have said, Act 166 is the universal yes. pre-K yeah. program in the state. Yeah. 
And Meg and I are really happy that we've both been invited to do this. We often co-do presentations and um, have similar but different goals. Um, so my role is really this collaboration between these superintendents. Um, and I really focus on quality improvement, professional development, accountability, coaching, and policy. My days are really spent responding around Act 166 Universal Preschool questions. Um, I support the local school district context. So at each of those 10 supervisory unions, there's an individual person who's the, the local contact, right? There's somebody sitting in Montpelier High School who answers those questions. Um, I support the superintendents in their kind of conversations. Anything that has to do with preschool, I'm usually in on that conversation. Um, and then I'm lucky enough to be the person who partners with those pre-K people that you talked with yesterday with their roles in these districts. Um, so I do all of the paperwork. You've been hearing about the pre-qualification kind of qualities in the law. It's my job to say the AOE has made you a pre-qualified program. Let's form a partnership between your private child care and our region. I represent the 10 superintendents in that conversation. Uh, we have community programs, including home programs, um, centers, and any school that money crosses over district lines um, falls under my hat. So as I prepared this testimony, I really drew on my experiences as a community-based teacher and director. That's where I started in this work almost 29 years ago. Um, my role as a public preschool teacher and as an itinerant special educator. I have a master's degree in early childhood special ed and a second master's in educational leadership. Um, I have a endorsement through AOE in early childhood special ed and a new endorsement in um, school principal. So we share this background as a context for my testimony and an indication of the knowledge that I have in this field. And as I'm listening to the questions, this committee has really, really great questions that are coming up. And I think that having talked to Meg and having looked at this testimony that I've prepared, we can answer some of those questions that, that keep coming up. As we start, or as I start this testimony, I really want to make sure that there's a language clarification. Um, when Ms. St. James talked yesterday about regions, right, and that the school district can limit where their boundaries are. Mm -hmm. When we talk about my region throughout this testimony, it's the group of 10 supervisory unions. Um, it's not the public pre-K region in the law that she was talking about. So we really wanted to start off with a visual picture of what universal pre-K looks like for our 10 supervisory unions. We have 49 community partners, so people that play the roles that you heard from yesterday. We have a preschool in almost every elementary school building within the 10 supervisory unions. Again, like I said earlier, we currently serve 1,400 students um, that are living in this region between those two ages, what we consider as preschool. We partner with home and centers, and we have several students who attend preschool classrooms that are not in their home districts, but tuition to other districts. So we have some Roxbury students who transition and receive their universal preschool in Northfield, just as an example. At a public place or, a, At the, oh, or an independent provider? Or um, a mix? It's a, it's a mix. It's a mix, it's okay, a mix right. <clears throat> so the 49 community programs are private providers, but we also have a number of students who go to public pre-K within kind of the 10 supervisory union region, if that makes sense. Yes, yeah, thank you. Um, so since 2018, we've had a unified partnership agreement so that partnering programs, community programs, who are within or who want to partner with any of our 10 school districts only have to fill out the paperwork once. Um, so they're essentially making the agreement with all 10 of the supervisory unions in one document. So you've heard from other experts in the field, including yesterday's testimony from some um, community partners, and I really am here to share about that superintendent's um, piece, R10 superintendents. So many of our collaboratives, supervisory unions, do not have the additional space and the staffing to offer full day programming at this time. We've depended on and we see our local community preschools as true partners in providing universal preschool to our region's youngest learners. 
Our superintendents agree that bringing four-year-olds into our public school locations is a positive move. It eases the transition to kindergarten, builds earlier relationships with families, increases the ability to identify and serve children with special needs. But when we're discussing repealing, which is really what this proposed bill does, Act 166, Universal Preschool, we need to think both on an early childhood level and on direct impacts to the schools. Our physical spaces in our schools are not designed to accommodate the, the unique needs of our young students. Limited building space limits the creation of preschool classrooms. When classroom space is available, funding for this retrofitting that will need to be allocated to design classrooms which allow for students' basic needs. Things such as lower toilets, sinks, furniture, playground equipment will all need to be considered. New construction and retrofitting of classrooms is not a quick process and impacts local school budgets unless there's state level funding that's allocated to offset these costs. This current proposal does not include a mechanism for funding those startup costs. The piece that I think will answer many of your questions around NACI and the accreditation and the quality improvement is this next section. So currently, we are across our private programs and our in-house preschool programs. We are regulated by this dual oversight of the Agency of Ed and the Department of Children and Families. So while removing the current dual oversight within a school building is seen as a positive move, the inclusion of meeting the National Association of the Education of Young Children, so those NACI accreditation pieces, um, feels to our superintendents like this only moves the current two regulatory system to a different and new um, set of criteria. Principals currently need to ensure that the preschools in their elementary buildings comply with two sets of health and safety, staffing ratios and qualifications, curriculum and assessment standards. It's likely that the requirements of being NACI accredited will continue to offer this duality in operations. If the current child care licensing regulations are removed, then adding the accreditation makes sense. Um, however, the implementation of this new standard criteria will require substantial early ed knowledge and substantial administrative support. The developmental needs of young children pose unique differences to health, to safety, to curriculum, and that use of play as that vehicle for learning. Um, I'm gonna pause and just say that the NACI accreditation standards mm -hmm. lay <laughs> out those questions that you had yesterday around teacher qualifications. That's in those standards. Um, and the definition of play-based learning that was just asked is also within those standards. Um, and you have a link to those, I dropped it in. We also talk with, um, with my superintendents, we also talk about staffing. Increasing the number of school-based preschool classrooms increases the staffing needs. To meet NACI standards, teachers must hold endorsements in either early childhood ed or early childhood special ed. As you're aware from other conversations, finding licensed teachers at any level is difficult and the opening of more preschool classrooms within school buildings will just increase the strain. Our collaborative region, like many others, has worked with the Agency of Ed to provisionally license both teachers in our public school locations, so teachers who are already in public schools are on provisional licenses, some of them, and some of our pre-K programs within the community also have lead teachers who are provisionally licensed. The provision of special ed education identification and service delivery models <clears throat> is not addressed in this bill beyond the option of bringing three-year-olds with individualized education plans, those IEPs, into a classroom space curated for four-year-olds. Placing a subset of three-year-olds into a four-year-old classroom does not provide an education with chronological age peers, which is something that NACI, the current field, the rest of the research, um, and actually the agency of ed um, all promote. Would you repeat that? Yeah. Would it, yeah. So the bill, yeah. since we're moving fours, mm -hmm. we're moving three-year-olds out. 
our current system. You mean we're moving three years? We're we're moving three year olds out of out of the public school building. Right. Okay. This, this bill proposes yeah. it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> Three-year-olds who are identified with special needs yes. fall under all of those special ed regs, right? Right. Oftentimes, those children, there's a mix. Often, children receive their IEP services within their community programs. Okay. Children with higher needs mm -hmm. who are on IEPs often are served within their public school program based on resources, availability, mm -hmm. lack of Right, what can we do for the dosage? If we propose to move three-year-olds mm -hmm. out of the public school building, which will inevitably happen because we won't have funding for them, and we have four-year-olds and we design a program that's strictly around four-year-olds, mm -hmm. the proposed bill does recognize that there will be a need to bring some of those three-year-olds who are on IEPs into the school program. Yeah. It does change the ADM functioning from, from the current piece to that. Mm -hmm. But the three-year-olds with IEPs would be the only three-year-olds within that space. And so personally, as a, as a person with a background in early childhood special ed, okay. maybe children who most likely have significant delays into a classroom that's chronologically a year ahead of them mm -hmm does not provide an inclusive environment. Did that make sense? It, it makes perfect sense, and okay. that's helpful. I, I missed some of it. Uh, now I, I think I've got it. Yes, I'm It does it. make total sense, but I just have to point out that yesterday we were given the exact opposite testimony, that three-year-olds do actually benefit from being in a room with four-year-olds. That's, what, that's why yes. I was asking it. But I think the difference is you're talking about kids who have high needs in terms of you know, there's sort of de developmental stuff and putting them in with fours could make it really challenging for those three-year-olds to feel good about themselves, build their own self-confidence. That, that's that's I, my I, take. Yes. Because Senator Gulick is absolutely right. We heard that, you know, yes. you've got five or six years old, five-year-olds in a private program and not in pre-K or four-year-olds, you know, those four-year-olds can help, you know, the others sort of come along. It's a yes and. Okay. Um, and so I'll I'll try I'll try and I'll try and explain it and people can ask for clarity if I if I didn't get there. What we know from national research, right, is that having a mixed age classroom, a three to five year old classroom, like discussed yesterday, right, like Allison and Linda and Stacy presented, that is best practice. What this bill does is takes our current mixed age in many of our schools, not all of our schools, some of our schools currently have a three-year-old classroom and a four-year-old classroom. But what this bill proposes to do for children who have IEPs, who are identified as special education, it proposes that one of the options would be to keep them in the school building. And we're essentially looking at kiddos who have special needs who are already delayed by definition of their classification and services, and putting them in a classroom that unlike what we currently have, which is threes and fours that's mixed, is a four-year-old's classroom. So threes and fours and fives that miss kindergarten together, best practice, we're now proposing to move four straight up threes out and still keep a segment of the population that we really want to be included with their same age peers. Did, did that answer it? It totally answers it. Um, I would just respond that that's what um, licensed and highly qualified teachers do. They differentiate instruction. I mean, that's through the whole system is that happens. And I think it's less about highly qualified teachers and more about the idea that children should be educated with children who are their own age, regardless of disability. Right. Yeah. Okay. And I'm happy to. Sure. And, and all of this being said, the current bill that the proposed bill is, the current law that the proposed bill is built off of, um, doesn't really touch special ed. So that's, it's the intersection of all of our worlds. Um, 
Yeah, and then the last piece that that we just as a that our superintendents really just wanted to get the messaging across is that this fiscal impact is huge, that there is a real difference between saying we're working as a as a supervisor union as a school district to really build classrooms slowly and be able to have it in a really thoughtful managed way and we are now mandated to have classrooms with capacity for all of our our people um so i dropped in a bunch of resources for you which you may or may not find useful i think some of them are around the questions that that you've had around the rand report um some questions about the accreditation resources some questions about the early learning standards um the piece around rand that i want to um clarify is that rand was looking at how we're going to finance right the recommendations for financing and so UPK's intersection into that was mentioned in there as one of the like current funding pieces, but it's really the systems analysis study which addresses the question that you had mentioned earlier to Ms. St. James. Thank you. Yeah. Chair, can I take the liberty of two minutes of talking about my morning, which will directly yeah. relate please, to this? Please. So, and I'm, I'm happy to capture this in a, in a written testimony too. I really, here's the example of the play-based and our current mixed delivery system. Um, so we have several community programs, as I've already mentioned. I had the privilege of being in one that I've been in once a week. I'm doing some student teacher supervision. So community childcare that has some universal pre-K students within it. Um, I was in a preschool classroom of 13 kids. I walked into the classroom and the teacher had prepared materials that addressed all of the domains that are in our early learning standards. And our early learning standards are really looking at the grade level expectations that is in the K-12 system. Called the children together, they worked through the transitions, there were definitely some social emotional moments going on, right? We're talking about a group of threes and fours called them together for a circle, introduced, they're studying the rainforest and they're studying the parts of plants. Um, and so there was an activity around what's a part of a plant versus what's a plant's needs, right? So very dynamic, mm -hmm. very grounded and developmentally appropriate and play-based practice. Um, and then they were called together for a story. They were engaged, they asked, Awesome. The children were engaged. The children asked awesome questions. Um, and then they moved back into their um, small group activities. And then they were headed outside as I left. And that is one little tiny microcosm of how UPK currently works in Vermont um, and how we can really do a, a mixed delivery system really well. And our kids are getting the, the early childhood education that they need. Great. Yes, I do it. Oh my God, am I still boxing? <laughs> you guys get sick of it. Um, I, I, a lot of people in this room have already heard me say this, but I'm going to say it again, um, just because I feel it needs, and it's to, 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 to your point earlier, um, we're here in the legislature to try to fix problems. Like, that's kind of what we do. Um, and a lot of times when we're trying to change systemic or structural systems is really uncomfortable for a lot of people and it's really hard and I think our for many folks the first reaction is no we can't we can't change and I appreciate getting data and I appreciate learning and I appreciate hearing stories um, but I do think part of our job is to imagine a different future mm -hmm. to to dream and think about possibilities that might not exist right now um, so what I what I would love to hear first of all I just say if every single superintendent is like there's no way this could ever work that's to me our answer. However, if we get varying testimony, if we get a lot of different uh, voices on this, then you know that that begs a different question. And I guess what I want to start asking folks is because we have been hearing a lot of no, please don't change the system. Is if you could. 
if, if one could change the system to, to reflect a little bit more what we're seeing in this bill, how would you do it? That's kind of, I would love to hear some of that. How could it work for you? Um, I, and I would just add, right I, now, if I may, but, also just add to that, as we're thinking about the, the world and what mm -hmm. we would like, we also have to recognize it's a very unique state. Burlington is one thing, mm -hmm. which I we all love. Rural Vermont is another thing, which is also very different. And we want something, I think, that would work for, for everybody. Absolutely. Yeah. I can start an answer. Yeah. Um, and then I did have a preview of, um, of Meg's testimony. And there are pieces of that answer um, that are within hers. So for my 10 superintendents, and I want to be really clear, like we're talking about 10, not the entire superintendent piece that's out there. They are not objecting to the movement of force into the classrooms. We, we all understand in this region um, that that is a positive move. The feeling from my superintendents is we don't have space. We're talking in the current proposal, right? I, I heard the, the change in tone and, and pieces throughout the, the earlier testimony. We're talking about a July 1 implementation date in the current proposal. And that's the piece that doesn't work right now in, in terms of a general feeling, right? We can't build classrooms. We can't create teachers overnight, even a professionally licensed system that lets us do that. We can't add, Lamoille South has 40 classroom spaces right now. They run two preschool programs, one in Morrisville, one in Stowe. They have 40 spaces for preschoolers. There are 120 preschoolers who attend community programs. I don't have the breakdown offhand. I can certainly provide it of how many are threes and how many are fours currently. But even if only 50 of those, right, are kiddos who are currently in the community who would be four years old and Lamoille would be required to have them, that map doesn't work. And that's something that our region, which while it is big, is you know still tight, those are the pieces, right? It's not... Thank you for clarifying. It, it's not yeah. this is bad, it's, it's this isn't the right Thank time. You. Thank you for clarifying. And to, sorry, I just meant to respond to you, what you said earlier. Burlington has a great mixed delivery system. Right, I know, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. And certainly, like, any other questions, and this is this is a snippet of, of Meg and my days, so. Should we pass it over to Ms. Baker? Did you want to add? I think that we can pass it over to her. Does that make sense? That works for me. OK, we've Maybe got it. Yeah. Oh, please, feel free. Please stay I'm there. Just, I'm just going to move so I can not strain my neck. Oh, OK. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> oh, my gosh. We all understand um, that. Afternoon. I'm hoping that you have uh, written testimony from me, because I did include a number of graphs, which I can no. <laughs> shared screen, um, but at least the separate handout that I'll get to at the near the end, it's easier to look at either on your own screen or in paper copy. Uh, so for the record, um, I want to say my name is Meg Baker, um, and I'm the Universal Pre-K Coordinator in Addison County. I work with three school districts, Addison Central School District, Addison Northwest, and Addison and Mount Abraham Unified uh, School Districts. Uh, thank you for inviting me to speak about S-56. S I um, have been the early childhood, um, the universal pre-K coordinator for the past eight years since the inception of Act 166 for early adopting districts. And I've been in the early childhood field in Vermont for over 20 years and have a master's in early childhood education. The focus I have in my testimony today is on the universal pre-K portions of S-56, although I'm happy to also address any of the other impacts on the early childhood system. I want to begin today with thanks for your dedication to children, families, schools, and preschool programming. The system is very complex, as I think you are 
gathering from all of this testimony. And I appreciate your attempts both to understand it and to affect change for the children and families of Vermont. From my perspective, agreeing on the purpose of early childhood of ed education is the first step in creating a coherent system of governance and funding. The benefits of early childhood education to young children are well documented. And the core philosophy that has guided all of my work with universal pre-K is that all children and families deserve access to early childhood education. All children and families should have supports in their childhood pro early childhood programs for success, and that all programs and staff should be supported to deliver quality instruction. So access, supports, and quality for all children. That's what we expect from our public education systems, and we should prioritize those concepts for our youngest children as well. The other piece I'd like to call your attention to is that we need to consider the unique developmental needs of young children. Child care and early childhood education, you're separating them out and they are inextricably linked to one another if, with this age group. High quality early childhood program isn't just pre-kindergarten, it's a holistic family-centered approach that's tailored to the unique needs of this age group. Preschoolers, they straddle a developmental shift from the individually responsive, nurturing caregiver giving that infants and toddlers need and the academic knowledge and greater independence that we expect from school-aged children. I wanna explicitly address a few points about preschool access and supports in S56. So first, moving preschool for four-year-olds into elementary schools, especially if you're thinking about transportation, might make it easier for some families to access preschool, but it will also create challenges for working families to access school day and school year programming without before and after school programming and summer care. It seems like it would be an easy fix to offer the um, after school and summer programs for younger children, but developmentally younger children need fewer transitions and consistent caregiving. So this supports the concept of sticking with a mixed delivery system for all children and families. As noted by others, current community preschool programs are likely to close if they lose most of their four-year-olds. There was a great Planet Money episode recently called Baby's First Market Failure, and I strongly recommend it because it talks about how private programs rely on four-year-olds to balance the costs of care. That's another reason to maintain a mixed delivery system. Becca brought up this point about access to for three-year-olds to inclusive classrooms. If you remove that age group from universal pre-K and ADM wait waiting, unless they have disabilities, it will reduce three-year-old access to inclusive classrooms. A comparison that I often do is I think about school-aged children. If you had a classroom, if you had a school and it had a second grade classroom and a third grade classroom, there is no circumstance in which you would pull all the children who had IEPs from the second grade classroom and put them in that third grade classroom. The same applies in the preschool world. And there are also huge developmental shifts between threes and fours, perhaps even more than you would think about between second and third grade. So I would strongly encourage this committee to look at maintaining at least current levels of access for three-year-olds. The next point is about CCFAP subsidies. They will serve more families based on changes to eligibility, but they won't provide universal access to early care and education the way that current funds do. Also, I'm a little concerned that families who qualify for full CCFAP as a result of income may be less likely to move their children to the public school environments because they don't have an incentive to do so. And the full day, full year programs would be more convenient for families. That means we may end up with concentrations of low income families in those private programs instead of attending our public school programs. 
inclusionary supports for preschoolers with disabilities and mental health needs are a critical need within the system. And so I'm excited about the study of special accommodations grants. These provide programs with resources to make accommodations or modifications within their programs and in their classrooms for children with disabilities. Uh, that might be extra staff or it might be specialized equipment, but there are some complications. I was pleased to see an email this morning that made some changes to the program um, that perhaps will uh, increase abilities of programs to meet the needs of children with disabilities in their private programs. And then the last point about access and supports is that in our region, we have a number of non-citizens and non-citizen children often support, experience multiple barriers to accessing and succeeding in early education programs and beyond, uh, including cost of programs, language barriers, poverty and transportation barriers. We already have access to non, for non-citizen children in our public education system for K through 12. And they're very disadvantaged when they are excluded from high quality early childhood programs. So I am excited to see that this was a provision of the bill. The next pieces I wanted to bring your attention to relate to quality. Obviously quality is the primary reason that we would want to support early childhood education. We all want what's best for young children and their families. Fortunately, we have research on brain development and best practices in quality care and education that can help to guide us. As Becca pointed out, this model is going to require a substantial number of new early childhood and early childhood licensed teachers and administrators with early childhood expertise. Although we have many folks in the early childhood world who have lots of experience, there are a lot of people who are not licensed as educators because there are not very many programs, because the paperwork and expense is onerous, and because historically there's not been any incentive to get a license. And that is a big reason. I've talked to a lot of people who say, why would I bother? I'm not gonna get paid more. In order to open more preschool classrooms, and Becca covered some of this as well, school districts need time, they need administrative expertise, and they're going to need significant startup and ongoing funding, more than I see in the current bill. School districts don't have a lot of experience with the unique developmental needs of preschoolers who require more supervision and health and safety precautions than older children, more holistic learning through play and routines, and greater family communications and supports than most older children. As I note above, early childhood education is designed to support the unique needs of young children. Without denigrating anybody in the public education system, there's a substantial learning curve and investment needed for districts to fully implement high quality early childhood education programs that meet their developmental needs. So NACI accreditation is the gold standard for high quality developmentally appropriate education programs, but it's rigorous and it's time intensive. And right now nobody knows how to do it in the school systems. We're not very many. School startup investments, which Becca touched on, it includes really concrete facility costs, bathrooms that meet this, the size and abilities of young children, fencing, age appropriate playground equipment and furniture, but it also includes cultural shifts and professional development for teachers and administrators in implementing play-based curricula, observational assessments, family engagement, embedded social services, and possibly shifting school calendar hours or year uh, to meet the needs of working families. School districts will need time, they need administrative supports, and they will need substantial startup funding in order to implement and expand quality preschool programs. The last piece in this section is about ongoing funding for district programming. So S56 changes the weighting of the ADM preschool. So currently it's 0.46 and it would move to be 1.0, like an elementary school student. That's roughly doubling. But you're looking at taking the number of hours from 10 hours to week, uh, per week to a school day, which is more than double. 
So district programs also already cost more than community-based programs. And these ch children are already included in the per pupil count for their districts. So you're asking districts to do more with less ongoing funding. If we're going to increase ADM weights, we're needing to, we need to increase them proportionately to the number of hours so that we can reflect the higher staff ratios and the relatively high per pupil costs that a high quality preschool program demands. The universal pre-K programs uh, funds have provided community programs, our private partners with a higher hourly rate than our CCFAP subsidy funds, which is why they were initially used. Community programs would lose access to funds that currently support quality. And if we want to replace those with CCFAP funds, we need to create, make sure that there is an incentive for programs to maintain that quality. And we also wanna make sure that those incentives and are tied to inflationary pressures the way that UPK funds currently are tied to an index so that they don't stay level funded over time. Um, universal pre-K, we've seen some real shifts in quality in our area. It has, it really instituted some quality standards. Programs that want to partner need to meet certain quality guidance, guidelines. So they have to have a licensed teacher in early childhood education or an early childhood special education. They have to be participating in STARS at a certain level. They have to align their curriculum with the Vermont learning, early learning standards. Um, the end of the very last page of this testimony is sort of a primer on this is how it looks in Addison County. And there's a bulleted list of what do public and private partner programs have to do in order to qualify. Those pieces would all disappear under your current model. And we want to sustain quality in those community partner programs. Community programs will be overseen by the CDD. This is about the governance piece, while public programs will be overseen by the Agency of Education, which leads to two separate systems of early childhood oversight. I get concerned that there may be a lack of coherence between those two systems, one run by the Child Development Division, one run by the Agency of Education. And we want to make sure that quality is well-defined to, in a unified way so that there's not a division over time between early care versus early education. A single system of governance for the birth to five population would be very helpful. One shift that I really would love to see for creating access, additional access and quality would be an increase in the number of hours provided by universal pre-K. Becca and I did an October 2021 survey of 30 Vermont school districts, and that demonstrated, and there's a graph, which I can share my screen, maybe. Nope, not that one. All right. Can you see the, the graph now? Yes. Great. Great. Um, so we asked programs in an ideal world, this is districts, in an ideal world, how much time should a high quality early childhood program offer children each week? And you can see 50% said 25 to 40 hours a week. And an additional 10% said 20 to 25% hours per week. We have a question from uh, Senator Weeks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. Just a quick question. Is this responses from program managers or parents? So this is from, this is from school district programming. Okay. So those that run the schools, not those that send their kids to the schools. That's right. So it's okay. in the school district, okay. the teachers and the directors of those programs. Okay, thank you. And Meg, I should tell you, we have five minutes. Okay, I will get through this quickly then. So um, let's see, increasing, um, so sh increasing the access to universal um, preschool 
by creating a universal pre-K program of 20 hours a week and shifting an ADM weight to 1.0 and proportionately increasing tuition payments to community partner programs would support quality improvements and access for all children and families. And then after that, if families needed more care, CCFAP fund, subsidy funds could support access in the same programs. The last piece I wanna share with you today is some information about how universal pre-K is working in our region in Addison County. So I want to emphasize that in our region, universal pre-K is working for children, families, preschool programs, and school districts. There are administrative headaches, but we have systems to make it be a seamless and accessible supported program for children in high quality programs. About 80% of our children are enrolled in Addison County universal pre-K programs, and even more are enrolled in non-partner programs. So that's pretty rare for kids to come in with no early childhood experience to kindergarten. Almost everybody's enrolled. Access to early childhood education is linked to capacity. And this year, if you look at the graph, um, you can see we have about 425 children that are enrolled in 36 total partner programs in Addison, Rutland, and Chittenden County. We have two home-based registered homes and 34 centers. We also have eight school-based classrooms that are taught by seven teachers because one is very part-time. But about 76% of our publicly funded preschool children are in private programs, 76%. Historically, we have a very, had a very even split of three-year-old and four-year-old children that are enrolled in our public and private programs. Most of our early childhood programs have served children in mixed age classrooms for children three through kindergarten. And private programs are relying on preschool programming to balance the costs of infant toddler care with their preschool programming. The last data I have is that TS Gold data, which is the pie charts. It's, this shows preschool outcomes. So universal pre-K requires programs to use teaching strategies gold in order to assess preschool student knowledge and skills and across multiple developmental domains. Teachers do the checkpoints, developmental checkpoints twice a year. And uh, the, those expectations, the children's outcomes are nor, uh, scored against um, normed developmental continued expectations. So, if you look at the graphs, it shows developmental progress. There's fall measurements that are on the left and spring measurements that are on the right. Green is meeting norm developmental expectations. Blue is exceeding and red is not yet meeting expectations. So in an ideal world, our red is going to shrink, right? This longitudinal data includes three and four-year-olds they're in both the schools and universal um, pre-K partner programs. It's about 400 to 450 children. And I'll remind you that we have 75 to 80% of our children in private settings. So the trends I want to highlight in this are TS Gold child progress data shows that high quality preschool education is making a difference to child outcomes across all domains. If you look at the data from the fall to the spring, there is consistent growth. Uh, Senator Hewlett has a question. Oh, is the, are the physical scores just, is that like physical education? So physical, in, it, it includes gross motor and fine motor skills. Um, in the early childhood world, uh, we look at a holist much more holistic picture than academic, um, but it, it, it's some of those early writing skills as well. How does a child hold a writing implement? How do they walk? How do they balance? Great, thank you. You're welcome. Um, you can probably see there's a big blank space and that's a result we didn't do spring 2020 TS Gold checkpoints because everybody was closed. So 
anything before that is pre-COVID, everything after that is COVID. And we have seen some impacts to child development, especially social, emotional, uh, cognitive and language domains, but I'm not seeing huge dramatic changes. And then the last piece is that in our area, social, emotional and mathematics indicators are consistently among the lowest. Children often make huge amounts of growth, but they continue to be our lowest areas. And we have offered professional development um, in an, and tried to bring some of those up as well. So in conclusion, I encourage you to maintain a mixed delivery service in high quality preschool programming to promote access, support school development of high quality developmentally appropriate preschool programming, unify early childhood oversight at a state level to remove the dual oversight and provide for greater expertise at a state level in understanding the specific needs of this age group, maintain universal pre-K access at at least the current levels, increase the number of universal pre-K hours through the increased ADM weights and proportionately increase tuition payments to high quality pre-qualified community programs, support working family, non-citizen and infant toddler access and quality by implementing the eligibility changes to CCFAP and maintain incentives for quality improvement in all settings. Thank you so much. And I'm happy to entertain any questions. Thank you both. Very thorough, very helpful. Uh, and I came up with a list of, you know, as you were talking, you know, just the things that would need to be done to get to a universal pre-K. You know, like you said, uh, cultural changes, you know, what would it be like to have a pre-K in the school, playground equipment, uh, just getting the schools up to certain standards, and that sort of leaves out the teacher shortage, which is huge, and just the construction of classrooms. So it, it's some work would certainly have to be done. It's not gonna flip a switch, that's for sure. Any final questions for either of our guests? Okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you both. Thank you for the opportunity Thank to you. speak to you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Great. Thanks. See you, Meg. Ready for Jay? Yeah. I'm going to have uh, Jay Nichols in. And they've seen Senator Gulick's uh, yes. bill. Yes. Great. Right. Okay. Is Bannon also coming? Or? He said he's on the way. Okay. He's on the hallway. So. Jay Nichols. Nichols. How's it going? One okay. One okay. And at some point, I would love to testify on S66. Yes, please. Yeah. And 56. Both. I mean, I'm at 56, but also 66. <laughs> Do you want to come in on 50? Yeah. You mean on this section, on the pre K section 56? Well, we have a strong position statement at the VPA about four-year-olds being in public schools that we've been supporting for about half a decade now. So we can give a lot of information on why we think that's a good idea at some point, if you if you want yeah, it. No, that would be that would be great. That would be very, very helpful for us to hear that. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. So I don't know if you're all speaking from one voice on Senator uh, Gulick's uh, draft proposal, which we reviewed yesterday, which I... You know, it's, uh, I guess, the best way to describe it. Um, <laughs> no, 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 no. As, as a, the, the next step that would get us to working on our school buildings and school construction. Now, if S66 does pass, of course, we'll be building 25 to 100 more schools, but that's not included in here, is it? I think it is. I think that's the estimate. So with that, who would like to go first? I think I'm first on the list, and we have not coordinated testimony. I okay. haven't seen Sue since Monday, and Jeff Fannin spent half the day with me yesterday working with new principals, but we haven't talked about okay. this yet. Okay. So. Okay. Mr. Uh, so, Mr. Nichols. Okay. So. Up. Yeah, Jay Nichols, Executive Director of the Vermont Principals Association, for the record. Thanks for the opportunity and allowing me to do this via Zoom as I was working with new principals all day today in South Burlington. Um, in terms of the bill, 
um, you know, we, we don't have a problem with anything that's in the bill. Uh, the only thing that I really had a problem with, Senator Gulick, was when you said the BPA had to be part of it and I had to do part of the work. But then I said, you know, I guess that's part of my job. So, <laughs> you know, we, you know, we see the need. Uh, we really are happy that the uh, committee and the, and the treasurer are looking towards what Rhode Island has done because we think that might be the path forward for us, something similar to what Rhode Island has done. Great. We're, you know, we're supportive of the task force and making recommendations to ways and means and the education committees. And we will engage in that work fully 100% and think it's, it's desperately needed. Our school buildings are in bad disrepair. Um, and I th just heard Senator Gulick make the comment about, um, you know, not having to build more schools, but consolidating. Um, there may have to be some tough decisions made in some places. We're at that point in Vermont. Um, and there are some buildings that we may decide collectively that it's not worth spending the money on, that we're better off to move students or build a new school in an area that covers, you know, uh, three or four current schools or something along those lines. And we got to be thinking about that. So my, the last statement I'll say, and I said I keep my, my testimony to five minutes, it'll be less than that, is that we got to be playing the infinite game. We could be thinking about 20, 30, 40 years from now. And so that's the mindset that we need to have going into this. What we've done the last 15 or 20 years is just patchwork and catch as catch can. And so I think we need a real comprehensive approach to, to school construction in a way that really supports 21st century learning, safe environments for kids and pleasant environments. All of our kids deserve to have, you know, buildings that are, have good HVAC, that have, um, you know, that are, that are well heated, that, are safe, um, yeah. have nice lighting, all those things. And I think that's where we need to go. And that's really it, I'll be subject to any questions. Fully supported. So, you, so you're good with, with it overall? Yes, Senator Dulek. Yes. Oh, uh, my comment about consolidation was sort of supposed to be off mic, but since it was picked up into the worldwide, <laughs> um, I was just, I was, right. big, I was basically echoing what we heard from Rhode Island, which was that, you know, they weren't necessarily able to build. build every single, rebuild every single building. And they did have to make some decisions um, around, I don't know if consolidation is the right word, but just some, some strategic decisions, I guess I'll say. And I don't know, I mean, this will help us get to that point. I don't know if Act 72 will. I mean, I think Senator Gulick's bill will help us get to that more strategic thinking around what building might be close to what building and does it make sense to, you know, leave one aside. And so, yeah, okay. Ms. Zaglowski. Yes. We also need you to come back in, you probably know, remember we were talking about the brochure you were working on? for recruiting school board members. Yes. And we said, you know, it'd be good to get something a little snappier. Yeah. Okay, so yeah. when we said, I've got this ongoing list of things. <laughs> okay. <laughs> snappy. I'm uh -huh. adding snappy to my right. list. <laughs> Sue Siglowski, Executive Director for the Vermont School Boards Association. Uh, I was able to confer with Jeff Francis from the Superintendents Association Thank this morning. Here. And you know, um, both of our associations have a keen interest in um, school construction issue and it's yeah. very high on our priority list. Um, and I do have a few, we're, we're in support of the task force, just have a few Great. ideas for um, perhaps even strengthening the um, proposal a little bit. Um, and I apologize, these aren't really in the order they appear in the bill, but they're pretty straightforward, I think. Um, the first one would be to change the date for the report to January 15th, 2024, instead of February 1st. Um, we feel like there's sort of a sense of urgency on the topic and that two weeks of time in the second half of the biennium could make a difference. So, um, so I'm sorry, what does it have now? Is February 1st. Okay. Is that right, is that February 1st? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, the second is um, we wondered if it would be possible to add the president of the Vermont School Custodians and Maintenance Association or their designee to the task force. Makes perfect sense. They're an important Great idea. stakeholder. Great idea. So. Um, and then um, third is we wondered if the governor's appointee, um, if it could be specified that they should have expertise in um, construction with um, experience in projects of this scope and size um, aligned with school facilities. Mm -hmm. 
Um, next, the governor's appointee on environmental or health so issues. Let's ask about that governor. Yeah. So, is there someone that would logically fit that? You know. I do not know okay. of a specific person, but I can certainly I check do. into that. Okay, so there I, is somebody I that would. checked in with my boss, Les Graves, on that yesterday. Okay, great, great. Okay, the next one is um, the governor's appointee on, on environmental or health issues we thought um, could benefit from a modifier to establish some connection to school facilities, environmental or health issues in school facilities. Um, for the powers and duties of the task force, we suggest adding one more that specifically requires developing or outlining preliminary prioritization criteria for state and local investment in school construction funding. So would you mind repeating that? Just so. uh, requiring a, a duty of the task force to develop or outline preliminary prioritization criteria. Okay. Sort of what you're talking about about 72, but then you're saying maybe the next step with now you're looking at the map, yes, and seeing where there could be or what the criteria would be, not necessarily looking at the map, but thinking about the um, yeah. you know how Rhode Island had the criteria, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, almost to the end, um. We wondered about asking the task force um, to formally collect information on the school construction programs in the northeastern states, what they do. Um, and in the statement of purpose, uh, we thought it would make sense to more explicitly connect it to um, connect this draft bill to Act 72 of 2021. Put some uh, language in there that says yes. it's continuing. Yep. Okay. Yep. And then lastly, um, for the legal assistance for the task force, um, we were hoping that it could, um, the Office of Legislative Counsel could be added to that, since this is a blended effort with um, the Treasurer's Office and the Agency of Education, um, and that there might be some attorneys in the Legislative Counsel's office that would um, yeah. have some expertise. With the goal of not drafting, but just staff it to answer questions, that kind of thing. Yes. Sound okay? Yeah. Those all sound great. Yeah, they all do sound great. Thank you. Would you mind um, emailing that to Ledge Council and copying Hayden and sending to it? Just so when yes. we see a new draft, as long as, you know, not seeing any major concerns there. No, and I, I do know that Rebecca Wasserman would like it oh, right. Rebecca today Wasserman. because I think she wants to finalize it by Friday. So, okay, yeah. so re email it to her. Um, actually, do you want it to go could, to yeah, you? if you could just send it to me, that'd sure. be great. Yeah. Great, thank we'll you. Do that. you CC. CC, yeah. Hayden. Hayden, Thanks. okay. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you thank so you. much. Thank you. Mr. Fannin. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, for the record, Jeff Finn, Vermont NEA. Good to see you again. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, thank you for giving me an opportunity to speak to you about uh, uh, school buildings, state aid for construction. It's been a moratorium since 2007, and I think um, it's pretty amazing. I I read the, the draft, and I was I was anxious to get at it. Like, yeah, we need to right. work on this. This is really important for for schools, for students, for, for educators, for principals, superintendents, school boards. Do you know boards. when the last school was built by any chance? The last school? The school that we had constructed in this state. Does anybody know? I mean, I think it was the middle it. school in Bennington, but that was a lot. There have been large, pro and this becomes an issue of equity, right? There have been some communities that were able to bond for, yeah. and during the moratorium, able to bond for uh, school repairs, significant or yeah. otherwise. Yeah. And other communities could not. There are buildings now, where uh, I think, where there is an auditorium that's that's condemned essentially can't can't be used because it's not usable. Uh, so the, the level of disparity is pretty dramatic yeah. and not good. And every school should be a sanctuary for students. Please. It really should be. And and uh, so they're learning there. That their learning environment are spending my members' so much of their time working there. environments. Yeah. Yeah. You've got principals and superintendents spending time on uh, band aids, as Jay suggested, uh, boilers breaking down that are you know way past their useful life. Um, and so we're, we're my father used to say to us, we're too poor to be cheap, hmm. right? Buy good things, take care of them, and they will last you a whole lot longer. Yeah. Yeah. And we're we're well beyond that point. Uh, and so I'm 
pleased with this the draft here. Want to support it? We do support it. A um, couple thoughts I have. Uh, we I heard from Rhode Island. We met with them in the fall. First, any concerns with what Ms. Siglowski put forward? I suspect you're good with all of that. Um, I think generally, and I, yeah. as a, a general matter, you I, were listening. I didn't. I, I was yeah, listening. Yeah. I didn't. Okay. The quote she had, the change or whatever. Uh, I'd like to see that in writing, but I, okay. I think as a general matter, yes. Great. Great. Uh, I understood Rhode Island to be when it did its review looked at schools that were beyond what I will call repairability, that they said to, there were incentives built into their whole structure, and there were some places where they said, that school, I think it was 10 or 12, as I recall, that they just said, don't put another dime into it. We're spending good money after bad if you do, and we're not gonna give you an incentives to do that. Again, we're too poor to be cheap. Yeah. And so then they said, start over. Raise the building, however you wanna do it, whatever, and we'll give you incentives to create a new school building. Yeah, I don't think it was consolidation that I heard. Now, maybe I heard it differently, but that's fair. I think they probably did some assessments I mean, along the way. Given the size of that state, there must be some, a little bit of easier to consolidate, maybe. I don't know. Like in yeah, certain know. areas, I don't know. What was the language? Um, you know that state pretty well. Yeah, it's yeah. 49 miles wide. Yeah. Yeah, what was the language that they used? I mean, it, it was definitely like we knew we couldn't do, it didn't make sense for us to take it down. And, Really? I, I don't know. I just got the sense there was some merging of some programs, pulling um, together. Okay. Yeah, and that's fair. Some, but I, and like efficiencies yeah. that they right. Well, that was Act Forty Six, right? There was some school <laughs> governance, and should yeah. we? And Act Forty Six was a bill, not designed to close schools. It was designed to uh, provide educational opportunities for students, mm -hmm. because it, what we found was that schools in certain parts of the state didn't have what other school uh, students had in other parts of the states. So, um, how many schools closed under Act Forty Six or before? Any idea? I don't know. Okay, I'm just curious. Don't know. And, and and again, it wasn't about school closure. Right, right. It was about governance uh, consolidation to hopefully provide more educational opportunities for students across the state. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah. that's why it was done, yeah. and why we had incentives to do so. Yeah. So anyway, we're far afield there. But, so. so one of your points is don't let people go toward the crummy old building that. Is going to fall apart. Like, like, do something to make sure that doesn't happen. Yes, and I think that's what Rhode Island did. Yeah, and I think that this task force is, hopefully, I suspect that they will do their job with fidelity and look at those things. And I trust yep. that they will. Um, yeah. A couple thoughts on that. Um, with regard to the uh, eleven, I think it's um, uh, a. B, excuse me, the membership of the task force, B11, a person with expertise in environmental or public health issues appointed by the governor. I think it should be a uh, Vermont licensed industrial hygienist. Uh, that's their job. They look at buildings. They look at uh, uh, exactly what they do. Uh, NEA nationally brought on some industrial hygienists at the start of the pandemic uh, because we now understood uh, that indoor air quality, for example, and other factors were hugely important. And there is the Association of Industrial Hygiene, uh, Industri American Association of Industrial Hygiene Associate, uh, Association, I'm probably butchering it, but anyway, there is a national organization of industrial hygienists that probably should be the appointing authority, I would say, not the governor. Not, no offense to the governor, but let's have an expert appointing somebody to this task force who knows what it is we're looking at. And just so we know, so this is a national organization. They sort of choose somebody within the state. Is that? I how think there's mean? probably an industrial hygienist okay. at least close because by. Because the only reason I ask is when we were looking at the bill yesterday, we were talking about per diems and all that kind of thing and what that might involve. That, that that's listen. If it if it gets us to the the good policy, you know, we don't want to be cheap. But let's also. That, that was my only question about that. Fair enough. I yeah, mean, I just, yeah. I, I'm not. Uh, again, no, that goes to your point. I'm trying to get yeah. specific. We yeah. want, I think an industrial hygienist should be involved in the, yeah. in the task force. Yeah, yeah, sir. Good. Yeah. And I missed this. Was that an add on or a replacement? Of I think a replacement of, of number 11. Okay. Of I, I think that's the concept you're driving at with number 11. Okay. I'm adding to how's that. Uh, but the governor still needs, is somebody, that still leaves somebody. Well, he's got the, the, the construction. Which okay. I think is right up his, yeah. his alley yeah. Uh, yeah. In, in number just, 10 above. It's that liaison between what happens from the governor's office on this committee and vice versa. I just want somebody there to... Right, and yeah. there is uh, right. in number 10, right. B, B10, you've got uh, the governor appointing somebody with construction experience. Right. And, and I support that. 
Great. Um, uh, I agree with uh, VSBA and the superintendents. Um, January fifteenth, I think the date was. Um, I agree. Every every chomping at the bit. That's my, you know, I think that's great. Mm -hmm. um, I think that is one of the note I had. Oh, I wonder if the appropriation at the end of the bill is enough. What was it? A hundred hundred thousand dollars to hire somebody. Uh, appropriated to the Office of State Treasurer for the Central Fund to hire a school construction expert to assist the task force. I just, I'm, I'm, I don't know where that number came from. I just was wondering yeah, if it's enough. Was, yeah, salary and benefits. Right. Uh, it's it, a preliminary it, number that we, to be perfectly honest, we didn't give it a ton of thought and time. So you can probably update that if needed. I just think, you know, taxes, you get yeah. a bit, you know. Yeah. So what we usually do in these cases, Senator Kulik, is the draft should go to joint fiscal okay. and they should come back and tell us what it would generally cost. Yeah. So that way we, when we get up on the floor, somebody will say, has joint fiscal seen this or where did the 100,000 come right. from? And okay. talk to joint fiscal and they said about 50 or whatever it might be. Right. So if you could get I don't that know. To them, I just, yeah. I always just sure. question. Yeah. yeah. Great. Other than that, support it wholeheartedly and Great. think that it's, uh, uh, 2000, since 2007, long overdue. Yeah. yeah, I didn't get elected in 2000 until 2009. So I, I'm guessing this was all just trying to, you know, turn off the spigot in terms of monies being spent, right? I, On school buildings, that's why the moratorium was put in? You know, 2007, we had started the recession. Yeah. You know, looking back, we had started in 2007. Everybody talks about the 2008, but it really had started. Yeah. 2007. So I, I think there was increasing pressure on the fisc on the Ed Fund, yeah. um, and then you throw into it: would, Should we be repairing buildings that uh, are beyond their usefulness, or if we're going to look at consolidation or other things? I think it was just let, let's just stop. Yeah. I don't. I you know. Yeah. Frankly, I didn't should have, but did not pay as, as close attention to it back then as I should have. Well, we could call Joel. You could. <laughs> I, I know how to read it. <laughs> so, so with that, That's thank helpful. you. Thank you for the the draft and looking yeah. forward. Any to final it. questions for any of our witnesses on this? Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So, Senator, I uh, feel like you'll take that and run with it at Ledge Council, sure. and then join fiscal. Do that. And then we'll try to get it out of here. Probably depends on what joint fiscal says to right. you. Okay. I'm guessing in about a week and a half, or something okay. like that. Okay. Yeah, sounds good. I think it's definitely something worth prioritizing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It seems like the just question is, you know, when can joint fiscal turn it around? Sometimes it takes a little while because they're getting all the requests. So anything that costs money, you know, nobody knows exactly how much it goes to joint fiscal for them to come up with an estimate. So. Is it um, in that way? We'll go to Jane and we'll say, "Hey, right. this is what we're hearing." If if we are time bound, this is and I, you know, I'm not, I'm new at this, so yeah, please forgive my ignorance. But could we um, move forward with the 100k number and then ask in the meantime get information and then amend it on the floor? So. It's gonna go no matter what because it has money in it. It's, it's gotta go, it's gotta to, go to appropriate. Okay. It has to go to appropriations. Gotta go to appropriations. So could we? We're not. We don't have a time crunch. We'll get five or six bills out by May by March seventeenth. I mean that's a lot. Wow. Usually we are out. Remember, we usually crossovers usually like the seventh of March, eighth right. of March. We have in legislative time a lot of time. Okay. In my yeah. world, that's a short time. Yeah. That's a month. Yeah. So. Okay. Because we're getting, as you'll see, next week's agenda is tighter and tighter and tighter in terms of, you know, what we need to get out. So things should leave here by around town meeting week. Great. Great. You good? Got to wait till S S five passes and fails too, because I don't know. Which <laughs> oh, we're gonna need it. Right. All right. <laughs> That's, That's fine. Fine. That's oh right. The, yeah. yeah, the one I've gotten two hundred. Yeah, two hundred right. emails. Okay. Okay. Yeah, and a bunch of it's kept the pages. It's oriented the pages to who we all are. That's for sure. I mean, the difference between the pages that had really very little to do and now this. Yeah. Okay.
we're finished for the day. Unless Senator Kulik, did you want to ask something on record? Well, just in, yeah, sure. Since we have um, BSBA and BSA, no, B, uh, Vermont, Vermont NEA. Yeah. yeah, I was getting there. Um, <laughs> here, uh, it, I just would like to sort of reiterate um, that we are, we'd love to hear testimony around Act 56 because the pre K piece. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. yeah, yeah. Thanks. <laughs> Great. Not today. No, no. not today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No. Anything else? We're done. <laughs>